how to improve on classical guitar. That's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to get started right now. And uh, we're going to talk about questions like, uh, how do you keep the right hand thumb from flying up when you practice arpeggios? And uh, how do you deal with a piece that you thought you could never play, but then you, after lots of practice, learn to play it? Uh, how do you understand classical music titles like uh, Opus 125, number nine? Um, and then artificial harmonics in higher positions. We're going to get into these questions and a lot more. I'd love for you to leave your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm Sean Beavers. I've been playing classical guitar for 34 years now, and I'm delighted you joined me today. So let's dive in. A question from Carlos. How do you prevent involuntary movement like flying up with the right hand thumb when you're practicing arpeggios? So the right hand thumb or plucking hand thumb sometimes can be very inefficient. So if you're playing an arpeggio, you know, like a simple exercise like this, uh, sometimes your right hand thumb can come way up away from the guitar and you don't want that. How do you avoid that? Well, you really have to practice slowly and focus on efficiency of that right hand thumb. So what I would suggest is just, just trying to find the smallest right hand thumb movement you can make and pluck the string. So I would use the side of my index finger as the terminating point for my stroke if I'm playing free stroke. Obviously, you could also practice rest stroke with the thumb as well. Uh, but if you're practicing free stroke, just allow the thumb to come against the side of the index finger as the terminating point of your stroke, and then move directly back to the string. Uh, if you get really detailed about this, um, it is true that you have to lift a little bit on the way back. Um, and so I used to think, hey, maybe I'm trying for a straight line, you know, straight line there and back. But the problem is, if you do straight line there and back, you're going to hit the string on the way back. So you do have to lift slightly, but the key is slightly. Because again, as Carlos is talking about, uh, there is a tendency that when we lift the thumb, we're going to lift way too far. So we want to lift just enough to clear the string on the way back, and that's it. Uh, so it's just kind of straight there, lift slightly and back, and then pluck again. So hopefully that helps, Carlos. Um, Chris said, Sean, your live streams are excellent, super useful. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I appreciate that. He says, one thing I've been meaning to ask is this, is there one piece you originally saw that you thought you'd never be able to play properly, but then after lots of practice in the end, you did? Uh, yeah, honestly, I think there have been a lot of pieces like that over the years of my journey of playing guitar, but what sticks out to me is Tres Piezas Españolas by Joaquin Rodrigo. So it's three Spanish pieces is the translation of that title by Rodrigo. And so the three Spanish pieces are the Fandango, the Pasacalia, and the Zapateado. If you're not familiar with them, they're very difficult pieces, very technically challenging. And I remember when I started playing them, I was already in grad school uh, studying as a music performance graduate student, and I still just felt like I'm not going to be able to accomplish uh, these pieces. And it may sound silly, but I actually kind of psyched myself up for it. I would put the sheet music on my music stand and I would say, I'm going to own you uh, looking at the sheet music just because I was intimidated by those pieces. And that was a way to kind of psych myself up that I was going to be able to do it. Well, I worked on those pieces for months. I had help from my teacher, Bruce Holzman. I had help from some uh, master classes with some great performers on those pieces. And eventually I did uh, perform those pieces on a doctoral recital and all also uh, perform them in some other contexts as well. So uh, those would be pieces that stuck out to me uh, when I thought of Chris's question. Um, I see several people there in the chat. I see Gene Madsen says, hello, Sean. Glad to see you. Good to see you, Gene. Uh, I know you sent a couple of questions in advance, Gene, and I will get to those in a moment. And I see Gord. Hello from Toronto. Gord, I know you sent some questions in advance that I'm looking forward to talking about. Uh, Jonathan Laird says hello. Good to see you, Jonathan. Colin, hello. Good to see you. And uh, Esteban as well. And uh, then I saw, I, I think Carlos and Stephen posted before the stream started. And I'll get to, uh, uh, and actually Carlos's question was the one that I started with a minute ago. 
Um, but all of you that are joining in the chat, I'm so glad to see you. And feel free to drop your questions in the chat. I'd love to, uh, to know what's on your mind or if you have a follow-up on anything that I'm talking about, uh, I'd love to hear from you in the chat about your questions or comments. Um, Anthony Nelson had asked uh, about understanding classical music titles. Uh, if you have something like Symphony Number no. 9 in D minor, Opus 125, what does that mean? What's the Opus 125? Uh, if you're new to the classical music world, uh, this is confusing. So a uh, good question there, and that is a common source of confusion. So Opus literally means work. Uh, so it's like work number 125 in the case of this example. But then what about the number nine? What's that? So within uh, the Opus 125, a group of works, then it's number nine. So um, to take this down to classical guitar, let's take, for example, Matteo Carcassi, Opus 60. Uh, so Matteo Carcassi, Opus 60, is 25 melodic and progressive etudes. It's, you know, the etudes like... Those are part of the Opus 60 uh, by Carcassi. So um, it's Opus 60, so number one is, and then number two is, and number three is, etc. Uh, the famous number seven is. So again, Opus 60, it's the 60th set of Carcassi's works. Um, and then the, within that set, uh, each work is number one, number two, number three, et cetera. So uh, how was that opus organized? Well, sometimes it was in order of the publication of those works. Um, in other cases, sometimes people have uh, posthumously organized those works. So in other words, after the composer died, they organized the works in a certain opus order. Uh, but whether it was by the order the composer published them or by an editor that came behind uh, the composer later and organized them, it's basically the standard accepted uh, numbering of how the, the composer's works are organized. Uh, those groups of works, the opus, and then the numbers. And by the way, sometimes you'll see other numbers, like with Bach, you'll see BWV, which is Bach Werke Verkreisnis, which is Bach Works Catalog. And so, for example, um, you know, BWV 996 is the first lute suite. Well, within that suite, there's then, uh, you know, prelude, alamon, Courant, the different movements of the suite, but it's within BWV 996 or the 996th work in the catalog. And again, that's not necessarily an order that Bach was publishing things. There wasn't really music publishing in Bach's day the way there would have been in later composers' lives, like in the, in the 1800s. But back in Bach's time, 1685 to 1750, um, without sort of music publishing, it was reliant on subsequent editors to kind of organize a standard uh, numbering. And so that BWV, or that catalog of Bach's works, is just a standard accepted catalog. So BWV 996 for Slute Suite, uh, BWV 1001, the first violin sonata, uh, BWV 1007, the first cello suite, etc. So yeah, I know if you're not used to classical music, uh, those things do get confusing. And I see uh, Glendale George says hi, good to see you. And uh, Esteban is from Uruguay, uh, good to have you here uh, from Uruguay. Awesome. So another question I got, this was from Jean, who I saw there in the chat. Jean Madsen says, I watched one of your past videos on playing artificial harmonics. You talked about uh, them being 12 frets apart. How does that work when you're playing a chord in the eighth position and playing artificial harmonics? Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. So like if you're playing an F on the first fret and you want to do an artificial harmonic, it's 12 frets higher. Well, really the 12 frets is kind of a proportion of the vibrating string. And so if you are on the eighth fret, then you can do the equivalent of 12th frets higher, even if you're running out of frets there, you know, so the ninth fret, 10th fret, 11th fret, 12th fret, you're going to do the equivalent of 12th fret frets higher for that artificial harmonic, and it's just going to be over the sound hole, you know, somewhere up here, and it may take a little trial and error to kind of find each of those spots. And, uh, and it can be tricky when you don't have the fret to refer to, but you're roughly uh, looking for the equivalent of 12 frets up. Now notice that the frets get closer together as you go into higher positions. And so that's gonna continue up here. So 
if there were further frets, they're going to continue to get closer together, just the way that the um, proportion of the string works. And so each successive artificial harmonic is even a shorter distance away. So hopefully that helps. Uh, that is a very insightful question, Gene, and thank you for asking that. Uh, another question Gene Madsen sent is, I've acquired music of other classical guitar players. They have their own mappings and markings and fingering changes. The copies can be a bit challenging. Should I get a clean copy of the same piece and learn the original fingerings uh, without rewriting all the changes? And uh, that's an excellent question. And what I would say is it kind of depends who did the markings. Uh, you know, sometimes you may have gotten markings from a really renowned player, you know, um, I remember one of my teachers had uh, markings from his teacher, which was Albert Valdez Blaine, uh, was the teacher of uh, Bruce Holzman, my teacher. And so Albert Valdez Blaine's fingerings were fingerings that I really respected. I appreciated getting a copy of, uh, a, of a score with some of those fingerings. Um, so, you know, sometimes that can be a really valuable resource to have uh, a good teacher or uh, player's fingerings uh, that you can go by. With that said, though, it can be nice to have a clean copy into which you can write your own fingerings because a lot of times as you become more experienced, you are making a judgment call. You're looking at the published edition's fingerings. Uh, you are examining different players and, you know, if you have access to their written fingerings, great. Or sometimes you may go on YouTube and just look at like, hey, how is John Williams playing this passage? How is Anna Vidovich playing this passage? How's Julian Bream playing this passage or whatever? And so looking at the fingerings of a variety of different players, then you may come to your own conclusion. So I think it's great to have those other fingerings, but it can also be nice to have a clean copy and then you kind of write in your decisions. Now, I always write in my fingering and decisions in pencil and the reason I do that is because I may change my mind uh, you know I may play the piece for a month or two and say you know what the fingerings I wrote in at first were crazy I'm gonna do something different now and uh, that's just part of learning and part of growing so um, I always write in my fingerings in pencil and then down the road I may change them as I examine uh, more great players fingerings and learn from them and just learn what works uh, for me as well now I see a question in the chat and uh, this is from Starflake47, love the username. Uh, when playing the chromatic scale in first position, I find it difficult to play the sixth string on my fingertips. Is this absolutely necessary? How about on the pads? So in other words, the idea is, you know, you're playing the, the chromatic scale in uh, first position. And uh, so, you know, on the sixth string, is it okay to be more on the pads and kind of curve the fingers more as you come across? Well, what I would suggest is you do want to stay on the pads um, the best of your ability. And what I actually do is I move my whole hand across the fretboard. And so, you know, if I'm playing like this, um, you know, my whole hand is subtly and gradually moving down um, you know, to get to the first string, and then when I go back, my whole hand is subtly and gradually making its way back across the fretboard. So I am seeking to play on the fingertips the whole way. Uh, very good question. Uh, another question that I got uh, in advance was from Gord, who was saying, if I'm shaping my nails in the right hand or the plucking hand, uh, would there be an incorrect nail shape that might give me a poor tone? Uh, I'm looking for a darker, more chocolatey tone rather than a tenor, tinny, hollow, metallic tone. Um, so, yeah, I think absolutely one of the shapes that I do not recommend is a sharp pointy nail. If you've ever tried uh, playing with a sharp pointy nail, that's going to generally create an unpleasant tone. Um, I would also try to avoid having sharp corners on the nail. Uh, so generally, I'm going to do kind of a ramp shape and round the corners so there's no sharp corners on that ramp. Um, and so I don't want a sharp point. I also don't want sharp corners on the edge of my nail. So a good question there. Another question uh, from Anthony Nelson is about discussing the difference between low action and high action guitars. And he also asked about the difference between metal and nylon strings. So in general, for a nylon string classical, 
Uh, I would say about four millimeter action, so that's 12th fret measuring from the fret to the string, uh, about four millimeters on the sixth string, about three millimeters on the first string. That is higher than on a steel string acoustic guitar where it might be like two and a half millimeters on the sixth string, two millimeters on the first string. Uh, so in general, classical guitar is going to have a little higher action. It's often helpful to go to an experienced guitar repair person uh, to get that action adjusted uh, or a luthier or someone who uh, really understands the ins and outs of raising the nut in the saddle of finding an action that is best for your guitar and best for your playing style and approach. Um, you know, the lower the action is, the easier it is to play the guitar, but it also may buzz more easily when the action is low. If the action's too high, it's going to avoid buzzes uh, more, but it's going to be super hard to play. So you want to find that happy medium where you're avoiding buzzes, but yet it's not too hard to play. Uh, so good question there. I see another uh, question here in the chat. I'm trying to learn the song Playing God by Polyphia and I'm struggling getting good harmonic sounds. Any tips? Yeah, so Playing God by Polyphia, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a song by kind of this rock band and um, it is played on a nylon string guitar. So a lot of classical guitarists have been interested in it. Um, Brandon Aker, who has a great classical guitar channel on YouTube, he actually has a cover of Playing God by Polyphia on the lute. Uh, which sounds really interesting. And uh, so, yeah, if you're trying to do, uh, whether it's that song playing God by Polyphia or any uh, song where you're trying to get harmonics, any piece of music, um, you want to know how to get them to come out clearly. So one of the things I would say is you want to be uh, make sure you're right on the harmonic node. Now, in harmonics that are like on the you know 12th fret, 7th fret, 5th fret, that's right over the fret. But as I was talking about a little bit ago, Sometimes you may be playing harmonics that are over the sound hole where you don't have a fret to reference. And um, my recollection of playing guide, I haven't really uh, worked through it myself a lot, but my recollection is sometimes those harmonics are actually off the fretboard. But whatever it is, whether it's over the fret or whether it's not, you have to find the harmonic node. So that is the spot where the harmonic comes out cleanly. And uh, if you're not used to playing with harmonics, starting over the frets is a good place to start. And then it's a little harder to find those nodes you know, down over the sound hole. So once you find the node, then there's kind of the specific way that you touch the harmonic. You want to touch it lightly and then you want to take your finger off because if you just kind of leave your finger there, it may dull the harmonic a little bit. So you touch very lightly and you let the finger off. Now, an analogy I like to use for this is imagine when you touch a hot stove or a hot pan or something, uh, there's kind of this moment where the nerve hasn't yet told your brain that it's hot and then the message gets through the nerves to your brain and you're like, ooh, hot, you know? And so I encourage you to think of harmonics like that. You're touching them just long enough to get the sound to come out and then you're like, ooh, yikes, and you kind of take it off. Now, I'm exaggerating. I don't really take my hand way away from the fingerboard, but there's just removing the fingertip off the string. If you do it too soon, then you're not gonna get a harmonic. You're just gonna get an open string. If you leave it on there too long, it's gonna kind of dull the sustain of the harmonic. So you gotta find that right timing where you've touched it very lightly, but then you release off it. So I think those things, finding the right node, um, making sure you're touching very lightly and then releasing the finger off right after, those are gonna help. Uh, one more tip with harmonics. Uh, some harmonics, and I know this gets complicated, so bear with me, but some harmonics have multiple nodes. So for example, this seventh fret harmonic is the same as the 19th fret harmonic. Well, if your right hand is plucking over the other node, you cancel the harmonic. So here's this harmonic. Now, if I pluck exactly on the 19th fret, that harmonic's dead. You're not getting it, you know? So you gotta make sure you're off of any other node of the same harmonic. And I'm not gonna dive in the weeds here because I know this is complicated stuff, but the main ones to watch out for are the seventh fret harmonic, don't pluck over the 19th fret. And then the fifth fret harmonic, um, there's a, same note for that one is kind of over the sound hole. So if you're on the fifth fret harmonic, you know, maybe play a little toward the bridge with the right hand. And in general, just a simple way to deal with this is when you're playing harmonics, you know, play more toward the bridge with your right hand because you're less likely to be on top of a node that's going to cancel one of them out. So hopefully that helps uh, with harmonics. I'm seeing another uh, note in the chat. I'm trying to cut down on squeaks while playing. Any tips? So I'm assuming you mean squeaks in the left hand. Um, you know, it's very common to make squeaks as we shift, you know, where you get this kind of noise. 
uh, with the left hand while you shift. And so to avoid that, uh, there's a few things we can do. One of the simplest, but actually quite difficult to do well, is lifting off the string when you shift. Um, now, the problem here is sometimes we interrupt legato. So in other words, legato would be connecting the sound, not interrupting the sound, um, but it's very easy if you lift off the string to really interrupt the legato. So what you might want is, you know, a, a pretty connected sound, but what might you might get when you lift off is, you know, an unwanted pull off or something, or just, a break in the sound. So you really have to work on being able to lift off the string and move quickly. And you also have to think of what I uh, like to describe as taking off like a helicopter, not like an airplane. So in other words, if you take off away from the string like this, move and then land like a helicopter, you're gonna avoid the squeaks for the most part. If you take off like an airplane, in other words, you try to lift off the string, but you're doing it with a little bit of a runway, then you're gonna get that squeak. Uh, so it's really a very precise thing. Lift off like a helicopter, fly and land, but again, it has to happen quickly so you don't cut the legato. Not easy to do. The other option is, hey, what if I could just stay on the string but try to avoid the squeaks? Again, that's hard. Sometimes people will try to be more on the pad than the fingertip. That may help. I know Parkening talked about, uh, Christopher Parkening, that when he would go in the recording studio, he would soak his left hand fingers in warm water before each take. Uh, so the, the calluses on the tip of his left hand fingers were soft and that would minimize the squeaking. So yeah, you could do that. You could kind of soak your uh, left hand fingertips in warm water and uh, that would help. But um, in general, I would, uh, I would suggest the lifting off the string is the core approach. And yeah, you can try the warm water or, or sliding on the pad or things like that uh, to hopefully help as well. Uh, so good question there. Um, also, there are squeaks that can happen in the right hand uh, where you're maybe scratching across the string if you're playing on the basses. And for that, uh, with the right hand, you just want to make sure you pluck, you pluck perpendicular to the string. If you kind of pluck at an angle to the string, you'll get this scraping sound. I see Gene Madsen says, thanks, Sean, for answering my questions. I always thought the right hand needed to be over a fret. You've cleared that up for me. So yeah, absolutely, Gene. Glad to help. Uh, very cool. Another uh, question that I got in advance uh, from Anthony Nelson was about, I haven't made up my mind in terms of which new classical guitar to buy. Should I buy a Cordoba or Yamaha? Um, so Cordoba or Cordoba is the brand that I like between those two. I like that brand better than Yamaha. I will also mention Alhambra. So if you're buying a guitar in, let's say, $600 to $1,000 price range, $1,200 price range, somewhere in there, um, I would say either Alhambra or Cordoba would be good brands. You know, certainly as you get more experience with the guitar, you may want to go uh, for a luthier built instrument. What I'm playing is built by the luthier Robert Ruck, and this guitar is valued around $10,000. But, um, you know, until you are ready to kind of splurge for a luthier built instrument, you know, save your money over time for that, then if you're buying a guitar, you know, $600 to $1,200, then I'd say either Alhambra or Cordoba guitars are good ones to go with in that price range. Uh, Yamaha are okay in kind of bargain basement price range, you know, a couple hundred bucks. But if you're spending $600 to $1,200, I'd probably go for either the Cordoba or the Alhambra uh, in that price range. Uh, good question there. Um, I see another um, question here. I see Glenn, Glendale George says, excellent, thanks. I see Starflake says, what should the approximate space be between the top of the first fret and the bottom of the string? Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so I was just talking about this a minute ago. So what I was suggesting is that the sixth string from the fret to the, uh, to the string at the 12th fret uh, should be about four millimeters. The first string, uh, should be about three millimeters on a classical guitar from the top of the fret to the string at the 12th fret. Uh, another question I got was, how do you master different rhythms? Well, in general, to master different rhythms, you need to understand the rhythms. And so it helps to vocalize counting for those rhythms. And it also helps to practice with a metronome. So uh, let me just uh, kind of show some simple rhythms as an example. So here are some simple sight reading studies. Uh, this is from a website called classicalguitarschool.com. And so if you're looking at a simple rhythm like this, 
you know, just simple quarter notes, half notes. Uh, this would be the place I would start if you're working on improving your rhythms before you try to dive into more complicated ones. Uh, but so let's just say I'm working on this and I'm trying to understand it mentally. I might count out loud. I might count like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, three. So in other words, I'm vocalizing counting, but when I have a long held note, like a half note, I'm holding it out. Now using a metronome is helpful because then it gives you a steady click that you can use. So I might go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, three. Okay. And so when I'm doing that, I am, um, I am again, clarifying mentally how it works. Then I might play it with the metronome. You know, as I incorporate eighth notes, then I'm going to use the same sort of process. So let's just say, for example, let's do this uh, line right here where we have. And obviously, I can just sight read that. But if I were, um, you know, learning to sight read, I wasn't very comfortable with sight reading, I'd be starting out counting it one two and three, four, one, two and three and four, one, two and three, four and one. And then again, I'd play it with the metronome slowly. And I find that's a really helpful approach uh, for learning different rhythms. And I see Jonathan says, been practicing rhythms lately. I set a metronome at 135 BPM or so and make each click be a 16th note. It just gets hard when there are things like five 30 second notes in a row. Not sure how I would split that up. Yeah, good question. So a lot of times it is confusing when the rhythm values get faster, you know, instead of just like 16th notes, then you have 30 second notes. So uh, if you have 30 second notes, A, I would say, you know, slowing down is your friend. Uh, so when you're going with faster rhythm values, you might want to slow your metronome down below 135 beats per minute. Um, you know, might be okay if 135 is each click is a 16th note. Uh, so if you're doing each click as a 16th note, then the 30 seconds, uh, there are two 30 second notes in a 16th note. So, you know, so in this example that you're talking about, Jonathan, so if this is your 16th note, one, ta, 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 two, ta, 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 and then you want to go to 30 seconds, then it'd be like. In other words, there are two notes for every click if your click is the, is the 16th note and you are playing in 30 seconds. Uh, so Jonathan, I hope that helps. Um, I see Starflake says, I'm sorry, Sean, I'm asking what the space should be between the top of the first fret and the bottom of the string. Yeah, good question. So that's going to be super close. Um, you know, I would say that's going to be generally less than a millimeter um, at the first fret. So usually when I think of measuring action, I think of measuring at the 12th fret. But yeah, it's going to be um, a very small distance at the first fret. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be probably less than a millimeter. So like I said, if you're not super experienced with um, you know, that sort of thing of doing, um, you know, adjustments yourself of the action, you might want to, exp you know, take it to a guitar repair person or a luthier or somebody who can uh, make that adjustment for you. Uh, now, another uh, question I got was talk about different scales. Too many guitar players memorize scales without actually knowing what a scale is. Yeah, so what is a scale? A scale is a group of notes uh, that are used in a particular piece of music. Uh, and 
When I think about a scale, I really like the term pitch collection. When I was in grad school, one of my teachers used the term pitch collection. And that's maybe kind of a nerdy term that's not commonly used. But I think that's a good way to think about a scale. It's a pitch collection. It's, you know, like you, you have this little bag of notes that you pull out and you use in a particular piece of music. So maybe you're in the key of C major, I'm going to use the bag of notes that have no sharps or flats. Or if I'm in the key of D major, I'm going to use the bag of notes that has an F sharp and a C sharp. But really, the pitch collections are organized, or the scales, the scales are organized based on a pattern of whole steps and half steps. You know, on the guitar, a whole step is two frets, a half step is one fret. So, you know, the most commonly used scales are major scales. So we're thinking about whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And if you go up a single string, that's easier to see visually than going across the fretboard. And so, um, you know, just having that pattern of whole and half steps um, is what makes a major scale. A minor scale, if we're going with a natural minor, you know, you'd have whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole. And that would be, in this case, an A minor scale. But the pattern of whole steps and half steps is what makes it a natural minor or what would make it a melodic minor or harmonic minor. So it's a collection of pitches. It's organized by the pattern of whole steps and half steps. And it's useful to, uh, when practicing scales, both practice saying the letter names. So for example, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So you know what those are, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Uh, but then also uh, to practice you know, with the sheet music in front of you, also to practice working on the technique and just you know, getting better at playing them. So there's multiple ways you can practice scales, kind of more for the understanding of where they are on the fretboard, where they are on the sheet music, and then also, sure, just playing through them and working on the technique, developing uh, fluency, developing coordination of the hands, that sort of thing. Uh, another question I got was talk about time signatures. This is very confusing to most people. Uh, I believe that time signatures can scare people away from notation. Well, notation is not as scary as a lot of guitarists think. Um, you just have to have a good teacher, a good YouTube video or whatever to help explain to you uh, the way notation works. And so I do try to provide some of those explanations here on the channel. Uh, so let me uh, click back over here for a second. And uh, I'm going to go back to kind of some of these sight reading examples that I was showing a moment ago. And uh, let's say that you have 2-4 time, for example. So here in this example, 2-4 time. What, what does that time signature mean? Well, the top number, there, there's a simple answer and a complicated answer. The simple answer is the top number tells you how many, um, how many notes per beat and, or how many beats per measure, rather. And the bottom number tells you what note gets the beat. So basically, this would say there are two beats in the measure and those beats are quarter notes. That's kind of the... Uh, explanation that's commonly given. I actually like to say it a little bit differently and maybe simpler. I just like to say there are two quarter notes in the measure. Okay, so if you just think uh, two four means there are two quarter notes in the measure, that is a very simple way of talking about a time signature. So um, then if we go to three four, well that means there are three quarter notes in the measure. Again, uh, that's a simpler way to think about it than saying, well, it's three quarter, uh, you know, this quarter note gets the beat and there are three beats in the, in the measure. Just say there are three quarter notes in the measure or the equivalent thereof. So in the top voice, one, two, and three, a quarter, two eighths, and a quarter is equal to three quarter notes. In the bottom voice, there's a dotted half. A dotted half by itself is equal to three half notes. Uh, so this is confusing sometimes like, hey, there's an overlap here. The bottom voice is ringing for three beats. The top voice adds up to three beats. But uh, within the measure, it's just those three beats. There's two voices happening simultaneously. Uh, so again, I would just look at it. The time signature is telling you there are three quarter notes in a measure or six eighth notes in a measure or four quarter notes in a measure or whatever. That's what the time signature is telling you. So hopefully uh, that is helpful. I see, I'm um, just checking back to the chat real quick here. I see um, still playing God, but this applies to other songs also. I'm trying to hammer on with my pinky, but it mutes the note or hits the wrong string or fret. Yeah, it's tricky. You know, the pinky is a little hard to control for hammer-ons and pull-offs. Uh, there's no question about that. And so, you know, you really need to kind of work on pinky hammer-ons and pull-offs. I always like there's this Segovia exercise where you do like... And that's the hammer-ons and then the pull-offs. 
And Segovia very wisely has you do the pinky twice as much as the others. So you do like this one twice, this one twice, and then you do the pinky four times. And it's because you need twice as much practice on the pinky. Same with pull-offs, he has you do. So four times on the pinky, twice on the others. And that's a really good way to work out that pinky. So it just takes practice of, you know, getting used to precisely hammering on, you know, make sure that my pinky does hit the right string and fret where I want it to hit. And then when you're doing pull-offs, developing the strength of pulling. And I like to kind of pull sideways into the Jason string like I'm doing a mini rest stroke. Uh, but I want to develop that strength and control of my pinky. And so it definitely takes work uh, to develop that. I see Gretchen says hello. A little music theory on a Monday afternoon is a good thing. Awesome. Uh, good to see you, Gretchen. And I'm glad you're liking the music theory. Uh, Gretchen, you say, I had a guitar teacher that used to tell me that the pinky was the most underestimated digit on our hands. Yeah, absolutely. It can be very useful. You know, there's some guitarists uh, that just kind of go by the philosophy of I'm not going to use my pinky, especially like in the blues world. You know, some guitarists is just basically like, you know, they have three fingers to use in the left hand and they're just going to use three fingers. They're not going to use the pinky. But I think, you know, in classical guitar repertoire, um, you know, if you get to you know, much classical guitar repertoire at all, there are situations where you have to use the pinky. And, uh, you know, there are other pieces like the Playing God piece, which is more of a rock piece, uh, where you're really going to need to use the pinky. And so you're just going to have to get comfortable uh, with using that pinky and making it, um, you know, more under control, gaining the, uh, the nuance of being able to hammer it on exactly where you want it to go. So good question. Very cool. Um, then another question that I got was about uh, music notation vocabulary, uh, things like CV, Roman numerals, fermata, numbers next to notes in a measure, etc. So uh, yeah, let me uh, click over to another example here. Um, so just taking a look at, uh, let's go to the Carcassi. I was talking about these Opus 60 studies. Uh, the 25 studies for guitar and progressive order opus 60. Uh, so yes, yeah, sometimes you'll see these things in the sheet music. You'll see like a little three by the note head, a little one by the note head. Those are usually left hand fingers. So one, two, three, four, the numbering of the left hand fingers. Then you'll see things like P-A-M-I. That's thumb is P and then I is index, M is middle, and A is ring. A lot of times people ask like, wait a second, why isn't it like T-I-M-R? And some books will do that, but P-I-M-A is for the Spanish words for the fingers, pulgar, indice, media, and anular. Um, and so those Spanish words have become kind of attached to the right hand because a lot of finger style uh, classical technique is out of Spain. So P-I-M-A is commonly used for the right hand finger. So you'll see that. Uh, you'll also see a lot of times, as uh, this question was asking about these Roman numerals like this, like what if you have the Roman numeral here? Well, that's Roman numeral three, means you're playing this in the third fret. Then the next measure, it's like Roman numeral eight. You're playing in the eighth position, so index finger at the eighth fret. And then it goes back to the three. This is index finger at the third fret. And then down the next line, index finger at the, uh, you know, the fourth fret. And then index finger back at the third fret then an index finger at the fifth fret, etc. So those Roman numerals are telling you what fret your index finger is in the left hand. Sometimes they mean barring, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just mean position. So it kind of depends from piece to piece and addition to addition. Is it uh, always meaning to bar at that fret or does it just mean to have the index finger located at that fret, whether you're barring or not? In this particular example, like this fourth fret one, um, it doesn't really necessitate a bar Whereas, uh, and the next one at the third fret doesn't, but uh, this one at the fifth fret doesn't, this one at the eighth fret, you would need to bar at least two strings for that one. So um, again, sometimes just means where your index finger is. Other times it can also be suggesting a bar. Uh, you'll also sometimes see these numbers with a circle around them. A number with a circle around them is what string you're playing on. So in this case, it's saying these bass notes are on the fourth string. So you're jumping from here up to here and back down to here, and the whole time uh, you're playing the bass note on the fourth string. Um, so those are some of the types of things that you'll see in guitar notation that are specific um, guitar notation peculiarities, so to speak. Um, so good question there. 
Um, I'll go ahead and check back to the chat really quick. Um, and I'm uh, not seeing any new questions. If you have a question, drop it in the chat. But I'll go ahead and uh, talk about another um, question that came in advance. Talk about ledger lines. Uh, what are the high high notes and bass notes on the ledger lines? How do you memorize the ledger lines? Well, uh, when you're dealing with ledger lines, I don't know that I would advocate memorizing them so much, although, I mean, I guess that is part of it, but I would advocate learning the logic. I mean, basically, any note on the staff or on a ledger line follows the logic of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then starting over at A. What do I mean by that? Well, so if I'm looking at the uh, second space of the staff, if that's an A, then the next line is a B, the next space is a C, the next line is a D, the next space is an E, etc. Well, if I'm dealing with ledger lines, that same logic applies. So if I'm dealing with a ledger line where it's like, you know, two ledger lines above the staff, so if I know that the top line of the staff is an F, then the next space is a G, the next line is an A, the next space is a B, the next line is a C. So two ledger lines above the staff is a C, and I can figure that out because I can count up through, um, the letter names. Now, yeah, it's nice to eventually memorize that, but I think you want to start with understanding the logic. It'll help your brain to memorize if you understand a structure. There's been research that shows that our brains memorize things much more easily when there's a logic and an organization to it than when it seems random. Uh, so if you're just like, hey, I got to memorize these notes above the staff and they're completely random, there's no logic to it, it's going to be a lot harder to memorize than if you know, hey, I'm just going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, line, space, line, space, line, space through the alphabet. And when you're going to ledger lines below the staff, then you just work backward through the alphabet. So say you're trying to find the G that's the third added space below the staff. You don't know it's G, but you do know the bottom line of the treble clef is E. So then what's before that in the alphabet? D is the space below that. C is the line below that. B is the space below that. A is the line below that. And of course, before A in the musical alphabet is G. G is where we kind of loop around to A. So below the A is going to be a G. And so the third added space uh, below the staff is G. So again, Finding those ledger lines above and below the staff, it's just counting A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and starting over at A, or if you're counting down to the ledger lines below the staff, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, going through the alphabet backwards, and then G again. And that logic will help you to get more comfortable with the ledger lines, and ultimately you'll be able to uh, memorize those a little bit more easily. Now, another question that I got kind of related to that uh, was how do I notate chords on staff notation if they're beyond the third fret? Well, the thing is, you're going to notate them beyond the third fret the same you would below the third fret. You're going to figure out what each note is and write it on the staff. So, for example, if this is a G above the treble clef, you're going to write that, or if this is an A, one ledger line above, or a B, second added space above the staff, or a C, second added line, you're going to add those on ledger lines. But if you're playing a chord, you know, something like this, these other notes would be notes that you might have notated down here. So, you know, this C is uh, on the first string is two ledger lines above the staff. This G on the um, second string here is the space above the staff. This E is the top space of the staff. This C is the uh, third space in the staff, uh, and then this G is the second line on the staff, and then this C is the first added ledger line below the staff. So if you're writing this chord on staff notation, um, you're going to just figure out what are each of the notes I'm playing, and then you're going to translate that into where they are on the staff. You can find diagrams of every note on the fretboard and where those individual notes are on the staff, and so I would encourage you to maybe find a diagram like that. Some method books will have a diagram like that. Like I've used the 21st century guitar method, and I think it's book two has a diagram like that in the back of where every uh, note is on the staff compared to where it is on the fretboard. And you can also Google that and find that on the internet, um, just you know, a kind of diagram of the fret and where each note goes on uh, the staff. Um, and then another question that I got in advance was about, um, I want to improve my sight reading. How do I improve my sight reading? Well, I would say start with things that are very simple, maybe a simple method book. Um, one of my favorites is the Christopher Parkening Guitar Method Volume 1, just to start with that. 
or a similar method book, you know, the node method, the Aaron Shearer method or something, but start with a simple method book and it'll kind of walk you through the basics of notation, the basics of where the notes are on the guitar and things like that. And if you go to volume two of the parketing, for example, it does deal with ledger lines and notes higher on the fretboard. Um, so walking through a method book is a really great way. Now, this question also said, hey, can you recommend a YouTube channel with some free video lessons on this? Well, I guess I'd like to recommend the Smart Classical Guitar Channel, which is this channel, uh, but there's lots of great guitar channels out there on YouTube. I also like Brandon Aker has a very good guitar channel. This is Classical Guitar, which is by Bradford Warner, is another good channel. There's a newer one called Tone Bass Guitar. Uh, they've only been around a relatively short time, but they've been getting videos from really top players like Pepe Romero and other excellent players. So. Um, tone Bass Guitar is another good YouTube channel. So there's lots of YouTube channels that do have really good resources. And while you're at it, check out this channel, Smart Classical Guitar, and uh, I may very well have a video on the uh, topic of your question. Uh, so good question there. Um, checking in on the chat here, I'm seeing um, Nasty Clan Gaming says, when playing artificial harmonics on the first string 10th fret, I struggle to get um, it to sound. This is from the ending of Julia, Florida. Can you show me how to sound that artificial harmonic? So again, it's hard to find artificial harmonics for very high notes. Um, so I, I kind of work up maybe. So like here is the seventh fret harmonic, eighth fret harmonic, ninth fret, tenth fret. So you really just got to kind of find where would that be. And you know, one of the funnier solutions I've heard to this is I heard somebody suggest draw with a Sharpie marker on that harmonic node. Man. I don't know. I, I feel like the Sharpie marker is going to rub off the nylon string pretty quick. Um, it might be worth a try. But in general, you've just got to kind of develop an instinct for where is that. Um, you know, where is that uh, spot on the string? So, um, you know, what you're going to need to do is kind of find where is the spacing of exactly where that harmonic is. And like I said, the logic of it, I talked about this earlier in the stream, the logic of it is the frets get closer together the higher in pitch you are. And so as you think about you know, where those harmonics would be, think about imaginary frets that are getting closer together and that'll help you to kind of hone in. But yeah, just to hit that harmonic out of nowhere is tough. You gotta really develop kind of an instinct of take your hand away, find it. <laughs> See, I missed it. There it is and just really try to get your hand used to coming off, I missed it, you know, getting your hand off the guitar, coming back and finding it. And, uh, and it's just tricky. So um, it, it takes practice specifically on finding it where it is and then taking your hand off and finding it a bunch of times and then being able to put it into context uh, in the piece. So hopefully that helps. Um, I see Jonathan Laird says, do you ever just write the chord shape on a score and then uh, still put like, um, bar at the seventh fret. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're notating something on the staff, you're definitely going to, if you're writing in staff notation, you're going to write each note. Uh, but then, yes, yeah, sometimes you'll put that Roman numeral seven. So B7 would be like bar seven or C7. Sahia is the Spanish word for bar. So that's sometimes you'll see like a C and then a Roman numeral after it is saying Sahia or bar at that fret. But yeah, you may write out every note of the chord at the seventh position, but then you will also, um, you know, put that Roman numeral indicating the you know, the position where the left hand index finger is going to be, where the bar is going to be, because that just helps the player to kind of lock, you know, lock in quickly to where that is on the fingerboard. Very good. I see Jane, Jane Madsen says, thanks, Sean. On the ledger lines, I do well on the upper ledger lines, not so much on the lower ledger lines. I'm still working on them. You know, with lower ledger lines, uh, th this may sound silly, but I think honestly an obstacle sometimes with the lower ledger lines is um, just finding the um, letter name that you're dealing with. And so I would encourage you, and this is gonna sound silly, I know, but I'm gonna encourage you to practice saying letter names backwards. In other words, all of us can say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but we struggle with G, F, E, D, C, B, A, you know, if we haven't practiced that. 
Um, and so I literally will encourage students and I would encourage you to consider practicing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Because if you get used to counting the letter lines backward, I mean counting the letter names backwards, then it becomes easier to count down to the letter lines below the staff because uh, your brain can very quickly run through the musical alphabet. So that, again, sounds silly, it's so simple, but I really do find it's helpful. I see Gord says, do classical guitarists ever play standing up? Say, if you were to do it, does it throw off your technique and muscle memory? Just curious. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I have sometimes played standing up, and um, I, it does feel a little different, but I have uh, actually on a guitar that I have at my house, I don't have it here, but I have a classical guitar with a strap on it, and so, um, yeah, sometimes I do stand up and play classical, and I just try to get the relationship of the guitar to my body the same, where, um, you know, the guitar and I are playing at the same relationship to each other as uh, we would be when I'm sitting down uh, with a footstool or with a guitar support. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to have that same relationship between me and the guitar uh, when standing with a strap. It is totally possible. I don't typically perform classical guitar like that, but in practice, when I'm at my house, you know, kind of practicing informally, sometimes it's a nice break from always sitting down just to stand up with that guitar with the strap, you know, maybe walk around my house a little bit while I'm practicing. And so, yeah, absolutely, you can do it. And, you know, some of the early music players that play lute and things like that, like Brandon Aker, some of those guys talk a lot about playing with a strap because, uh, you know, lute players and early guitar players from the, um, you know, 1700s and things like that, they would play with a strap. And so, um, you know, some of the period instrument players are more comfortable playing with a strap than maybe some modern classical guitarists who are like really set on either using a footstool or guitar support. Uh, so good question there. I see Diana Potts says, how do you like the Mel Bay first method book compared to classical ones? I have found that one to be excellent and what I initially learned on the exercises aren't classical. However, the folk country exercises to enrich music knowledge, especially for gaining a knowledge of traditional American, Native American, and European folk music. Yeah, you know, the Mel Bay method, the Hal Leonard method, those are uh, certainly well-known and respected methods. Honestly, if I'm going to do a method that's not classical, um, I actually like um, the 21st century guitar method. I've got it right over here. Uh, looks like this. So I really like the 21st century method if you're going to do more of a kind of popular guitar, folk guitar method. But Mel Bay and Hal Leonard are very respected. They've been around a long time, so no quibbles with them. But for me, I like the 21st century method for uh, teaching kind of rock and, and folk. But, um, but you know, each one has its own approach. Obviously, if you do a classical method, it's going to be focused more in on the finger style technique. Most of the folk methods like the, you know, Mel Bay, the um, Hal Leonard or the 21st century or any of those, uh, they're going to be focused more on playing with a pick. So it all depends on what your goals are. Uh, you know, um, certainly as far as the basic note reading and stuff like that, any of those methods are going to help you with basic note reading and learning chords and stuff. But, um, you know, as far as if you really want to hone classical technique, the classical methods will help more there. If you really want to hone uh, playing with a pick, then uh, some of the more pick style methods will be more focused there. Uh, so good question uh, there from Diana. And I said, I see, uh, Gord says, cool, thanks for the insight. I'll check that dude out. Uh, very nice. And um, I see another question that I got in advance was, um, how do I master playing notes and rest beyond two flags? So again, two flags would be 16th notes, so beyond that's 30 seconds or 64. Jonathan was asking about 30 seconds earlier. And so yeah, I think just you know slowing down, Jonathan was talking about using the click as the 16th. Um, so you know if you have a click that's your 16th and you wanna play 30 seconds, then it's two notes per click. So if the click is my 16th, one E and uh, then my 30 seconds gonna be two notes per click. And then if I wanted to do 64th notes, which would be four flags or four beams, then I would do four notes per click. And what I would 
uh, encourage is really master each level of rhythm before you go to the next. You know, if you haven't mastered quarter notes, really strive to master quarter notes before you go to eighth notes. If you haven't mastered um, eighth notes, really master those before you go to sixteenths. If you haven't mastered sixteenths, really master those before you go on to thirty seconds. 64ths, etc. And really, you know, you don't run into 64th notes all that often or 128th notes very, very rarely, which would be, um, you know, there'd be 228ths and a 64th, 264ths and a 32nd, etc. But uh, really, it's very rare for you to run into anything past 30 seconds. And a lot of classical repertoire, all you need is 16ths. You don't even need 30 seconds for a lot of classical repertoire. So, um, you know, learn each level of rhythm and kind of work your way up to some of the more complicated rhythms. Another question I got in advance was from David English and he said, how do you play this chord? He sent a graphic, but I wasn't able to get the graphic on screen for you. So I'll just kind of describe it. So it has an A on the sixth string and then it has notes from the first string down, or I'm sorry, fourth string down, fourth, third, second, first, but there's no note on the fifth string. And so he's kind of saying it shows that you can strum this chord. How do you strum this chord without sounding the fifth string? Well, there's a few different ways, David, that you could do that, that you could play basically this chord, but you don't want the note on the fifth string to sound. Um, so one way would be, um, you know, kind of arch your bar where you're kind of muting the fifth string there. And so you're actually, your barring finger is muting that, but you've got, and it takes a little adjustment, I didn't get the notes quite clear, but you get the notes clear on the bar on the first, second, and sixth string, but you're intentionally muting the fifth string, that'd be one way. Another way is act like you're fretting the whole bar chord, so you've got the third finger there, but just don't press the third finger down, so intentionally you're muting uh, with that third finger. That would be another way. Another way is to kind of step the strum over the fifth string. The problem is it's very hard to do that without an audible gap like I just had. Um, so another thing you could do in this particular case, and it depends on the context because he didn't send any context, he just sent the one chord. But let's say if it really was this chord, just play the A on the fifth string instead of on the sixth string, and then just strum it like that got it you don't have to worry about you know this whole skipping and muting and all this complicated stuff so if there's not a reason not to I'd probably just play it like that with the open fifth string uh, but if there was some circumstance where I had to do the muting then yeah I could mute with the bar mute with the third finger or try to skip the right hand over that string you know in the strum but that would be my least preferred option because it's really hard to get that to, to come out without a little gap in sound a good question there. Another question that I got in advance was self-tuning guitars, yes or no? Um, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down on self-tuning guitars. Well, I've never tried a self-tuning guitar, but you know what? I love the concept, the idea that, hey, you've got something on your headstock that tunes the guitar up and down for you. I love that idea. I would love to have one. Uh, I've never I've never played one. So um, I guess my jury's out. I, I want to try one sometime and then uh, decide but I love the concept. I mean, tuning can be such a pain. So if you have the guitar with an electronic tuner built in and it just tunes the tuning pegs for you, I would be totally fine with that. I just haven't had a chance to try one. Uh, a couple other questions I got in advance. If I tried to learn the guitar with my nails cut really short, would I have to change my technique? Yeah, potentially. You know, if you want to have the nails really short, I always like uh, sort of a sixteenth of an inch past the end of the fingertip on IMA and an eighth of an inch past the end of the fingertip on the thumb. But if I were, uh, you know, trying to play with much shorter nails, um, I would definitely need to make sure I was very precise in the way I was touching with the fingertip because I would still want to get a combination of nail and flesh. So I would tweak my uh, technique a little bit in that instance. Uh, another question I got was besides rest stroke and free strokes, have you ever heard of a slide stroke? It's apparently a little used Segovia invention. Yeah, so Segovia would turn his hand sideways and I've heard it called uh, a slice. Um, this questioner called it a slide stroke, uh, but um, I've heard it called a slice where you just kind of slide through the string uh, to the side. And that is um, a way that Segovia would sometimes get a really a warm tone on a particular melody note. You know, he might roll a chord and he would just, you know, kind of turn that ring finger and bring it through the string on the side. 
and get just a really sweet melody note to pop out. So I consider it a special effect, but it can be nice to kind of get a certain melody note to come out uh, really clearly. I see Diana says, has anyone ever tackled uh, Viernes Westminster or Carillon? Um, I have not played those particular pieces, um, but uh, thanks for the question. Certainly pieces that I may consider. I've tried, but very tall chords uh, can condense the chords to simplify accenting the important notes in the overall sound. So yeah, sometimes if you're tackling a piece with dense chords, you know, taking a couple notes out of the chord uh, can be helpful. A couple other questions I saw. Uh, if you have a new student and their nails are different than yours, how do you deal with that? Uh, so basically, I always encourage um, you know, a similar ramp shape, uh, sort of a ramp from the thumb side sloping up toward the pinky side and rounding off the corners. Uh, that is what I recommend. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm going to wrap up the stream for now, uh, but I plan to be live again next Monday, so I look forward to seeing you then. Feel free to send me questions uh, between now and then. You can just leave questions on the comments of this video that you'd like me to discuss next week. Uh, but until then, Keep making music.